Delighted to be joined today by Ian Maxwell, who is the brother of Ghislaine Maxwell, and I'm pleased to say he's in the office. Thank you very much for being here. This is obviously an extremely sensitive topic, and uh, there is an ongoing legal trial, so we have to be rather careful in what we talk about. But I'd like to start by saying you, your sister has been accused of heinous crimes, is uh, notorious now globally. How unfairly do you think she has been treated? Well, I, I think that um, the, the key thing that uh, I've always thought about this is that she should never have been put on trial. The case against her is really a case against Jeffrey Epstein that's been reverse engineered post his death against my sister. And it's been driven from the start by a, a combination of enormous embarrassment uh, on the part of the US legal authorities on the one hand and by the greed of the lawyers of the accusers on the other hand and that has whipped up a tremendous fury against my sister that has totally trashed her uh, presumption of innocence and uh, has led to her being jailed for over 525 days in isolation, treated as guilty uh, before any trial, and by virtue of being a pretrial detainee, she is innocent. Uh, but that's been completely cast aside. She's uh, been, uh, as I said, kept in isolation. She has been woken up every 15 minutes throughout the night for over 500 days by torchlights, allegedly in order to see if she's uh, alive because she's de de deemed to be a, a suicide risk, which patently she's not. She's been denied bail four times by the judge at first instance and twice by the appeal court judges. Uh, she's been brought to the trial uh, as recently as yesterday in four-point shackles from her jail, forced to walk up stairs and downstairs inside the courtroom. She's not being fed properly. She's not being able to see her lawyers more than 15 minutes during the trial pre and post uh, hearings. I mean, this is outrageous. And uh, it's in a first world country like the United States of America. It's a disgrace. And that's why the family lodged a complaint uh, with the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention in Geneva just about three weeks ago, because America must be held to account for what has happened here. I mean, I suppose a lot of the justification for her treatment would be her isolation and, as you say, the torchlight in her, uh, on her at night would be for her own protection, because there's a lot of conspiracy theory the, the, the idea that Jeffrey Epstein didn't necessarily kill himself, but was in fact bumped off. And so, I mean, do you fear for your sister's safety? I do. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, wholly convinced that he killed himself, actually. I think it's uh, not been very well explained how a man supposedly under 24-7 guard in, in broadly similar isolated conditions to those my sister is experiencing could somehow die on the U.S. watch. It's, it's extraordinary to me. So, yes, I think uh, there is a possibility that she's in some danger. I don't buy the, um, the suicide watch regime. It's a nonsense. She's not a suicide risk. She's, there's been no evidence of any self-harm intent. Obviously, she's not a, a danger to uh, third parties, which the judge has acknowledged uh, on numerous occasions. So this is... Uh, and I can only read it this way, torture, and it's designed to break her. And the result is that today, although you know she turns up uh, for trial every day and uh, looks the best she can, she's clearly frail. She's clearly lost an enormous amount of weight. And I don't know uh, how much more of this she can take. Do you get to, have you been able to talk to her? No, I haven't talked to my sister since the 10th of June, 2019. And I happen to remember that because all the whole part of family got together for the first time in uh, eight years. And on that day, which would have been my father's 96th birthday, so I remember it well. Gosh. 
Um, I mean, do you get have you written to her? Do you have any communication at all? Does she know about your? Yes, she does. Yeah. She, she she knows that uh, that I'm talking to the media on her behalf. Yes, we can communicate with her through her lawyers because her lawyers, uh, well, uh, free trial. We're seeing her for several hours a day, whether by Zoom, sometimes in person. And don't forget, the bulk of her sentence has been served in the midst of the pandemic and when there were no in-person uh, visits to prisons anywhere in the world, I, I would have thought, certainly not in America. Mm. So if we want to say things to her or get messages to her, then we do it through the lawyers and they come back the same way. So in that sense, there is a communication, but it's not the same as giving your sister a hug and saying hi and, and so on. Are you very close as, as siblings? Have yes, you? very. Yeah. We're all very close. There's a gap of 15 years between my older sister, Anne, who's now 73, and my younger sister, Gillen, who's uh, going to be 60 on Christmas Day. And uh, when you had the kind of alpha male father that we did, you tended to stay close as kids, and, and we remained close as adults. I wanted to ask you about that, actually. I mean, you must have had a very unusual and extraordinary upbringing. Your father was a, a tycoon and, a, and an alpha male figure. What was family life like for you? Well, um, it, was, it was an extraordinary experience, not because uh, we had some vast amount of uh, wealth and access to all kinds of goodies. Uh, my father was a pretty tough dad, and uh, he was a believer that if uh, you had privileges, you also had obligations, and he was a pretty serious kind of guy and um, brought us up to work hard. And uh, if we didn't, we were belted, as I remember it pretty well. And I was hit a few times yes. <laughs> for bad school reports. But there was also a lot of love there. And uh, he also had a good sense of humor. You had to know which side of the, you know, which side to stay on him. I mean, the best way I could describe this would be in the form of a Chinese proverb that, that says, never be too far from the sun that you freeze, never be too close to it that you burn. And uh, it's a very narrow line. Yes. And we had to run it. And I suppose in the press, it's been made out a lot that Ghislaine was, was, his dar was his darling, the apple of his eye, the boat named after her. Is that fair? Is that true? I don't think that's completely true. I know uh, people have thought that, partly because uh, he ended up naming his boat the Lady Ghislaine. But the story behind that is a much more prosaic story. He actually wanted to call it the Lady Elizabeth, which was named for my mother, but there already was a Lady Elizabeth, and the, you couldn't have two boats with the same name. And I think there were, I'm not sure at that point whether he decided what was the best way to deal with it. So he went from uh, my mother to the, our youngest sister, Ghislaine, and that's how that happened. But Ghislaine, like uh, all of our, me and my siblings, you know, if she was in trouble, she was cast out, and, and she had a fair amount of uh, tough times with my father. Mm. Would you think that she feels the same way about your father as you do? Yes, yeah. I, I think so. And it's pretty, it, you know, we're pretty clear about it. Uh, he, we love him, He's the only father we ever knew. I think we were all at some point in fear of him, but the overwhelming memory is a positive one, not a negative one. Yeah. And again, I'm well aware of the, the, that we can't talk about the, the case. But when did you first become aware of Jeffrey Epstein and his relationship with your sister? I suppose I would have uh, known about the relationship sometime after it started in the early 90s. But I and my brother Kevin were then in, in terrible trouble uh, because uh, our father's business had blown up. We were directors of it. We were subsequently arrested in June 92 and then had four years in the wilderness and, and then a, and a very... Uh, well-covered trial, criminal fraud trial, mm. uh, which ran from 95 to 96. And there was no time in that context to really do anything other than fight for our lives. And I lost my marriage in that process. And um, I didn't see very much of my sister during that whole period of time. I couldn't travel. Our passports had been taken and so on. And only when we were acquitted in January 96, uh, finally, uh, we, we flew off to um, America to see uh, Ghislaine, and she effected a number of business introductions for us. And in, on that occasion, I remember meeting Jeffrey Epstein for lunch. 
with Gillen and with uh, Kevin. And um, I have to say, I, I didn't warm to him. He didn't strike me as a, he, he was a bit of a cagey character, clearly intelligent, had a certain charisma. Mm. But he was somebody who took things from you rather than gave things back. Mm. He's not a man, not a very clubbable man, not a man you want to go and have a drink with. Yes. And that was the only time that I met him. And could you tell that your sister was, I mean, one of the versions of this story is that your sister was totally besotted with him. Did you get that impression? Not by the time I met him in 1996. I, I guess that relationship had been ongoing already since, um, I don't know, 92 for sure. And therefore, I think it had passed its apogee, yeah. if you see what I mean. Um, so I didn't get that impression when I was when I was there with them. But, you know, we... I've now seen photographs that have been released uh, during the course of this trial, that, and I, although I don't know what those the dates are on mm. them, but I'm assuming it would have been very early in their relationship, and it's clear that uh, that she was very fond of him. I mean, I don't want to be all sort of cod Freudian here, but th there have been a lot of suggestions that she was attracted to him because, like your father, he was rich, powerful, and frightening. Well, I, I can see that that's a that's a, a, a relatively easy jump to make. She has had uh, boyfriends, and she had a very long-standing boyfriend uh, for about seven years or so, uh, immediately following going out with Jeffrey, so sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s, who also happened to be wealthy and so on. She's somebody who uh, grew up um, with a demanding father, intelligent. She was present at constant dinners and lunches and, uh, and uh, social events where she met a lot of very interesting people, some of them wealthy, some of them just brilliant scientists and, and so on. So she was used to being with intelligent men uh, whom she could respect and so on. And it, it, inevitably, in those kind of circles, there's a lot of money at the same time. Mm. So I don't think that it follows that she went directly from my father to... Jeffrey uh, as a sort of clone, mm. but you know, if it hadn't been Jeffrey, it would have been some other rich, intelligent man. But she's also clearly a very attractive figure in her own way. She had a lot of charm over people. She had a lot of hold over a lot of powerful and influential men. I don't know if she had a hold. I think she was. Uh, an, uh, she's an attractive girl. She's well educated. Uh, she had good conversation. She had a good network. She had a good brain. She made a lot of herself. You know, she uh, ended up late in her, relatively late in her life, uh, on taking on all kinds of new tasks, whether it's uh, qualifying to become a helicopter pilot or qualifying to become a submariner or taking uh, quite complicated uh, uh, medical courses. She's somebody who likes to keep busy and uh, to do things, and that's an attractive character, a uh, set of characteristics that attract People. Why do you think it is that there's so much conspiracy talk around this subject? Um, I mean, your father was, you know, I think it's, it's now established that he had links with Mossad, and that seems to play into theories about your sister and Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, do you, do you buy any of the theories? Uh, as between uh, conspiracy theories and cock-up theories, I'm a <laughs> cock-up man, and yeah. I always have been. I think conspiracies are really difficult to mount. I think they are complex ideas. What is a conspiracy? It's a meeting of minds. That's the fundamental idea behind a conspiracy, mm. certainly in the law. And um, it's therefore, you've got to imagine how these things can possibly happen. People have to sit around and talk and agree and plan and so on. That's not my experience mm. of life. So I don't buy a lot of the conspiracy theories at all. It so happens that one of the conspiracy theories is uh, about my father, that he was murdered rather than committed suicide or had an accident. Mm. Of all of my siblings, Gillen is the only one who happens to believe that he was murdered. And I would uh, venture to believe that she may also think that Epstein was murdered. So... I, th those are conspiracy theories that have got some, you, you might be able to stand them up to an extent, but it's so long ago in the case of my father now that probably all, any such evidence has gone out of the door, and we don't know about Epstein. Mm. Uh, as for 
uh, involvement with, say, the Mossad in the case of uh, uh, Guillain and or Epstein himself, I don't buy that. I haven't seen any evidence for it, mm. and uh, nothing has been advanced. But we live in a world which is where conspiracy is currency. And mm. you can see that social media is fueled with endless conspiracies and fake, deep fake imagery and deep fake text and so on. And you, you've just got to be adept at deciding what you're going to take and what you're not going to take. So mm. I happen to think that uh, most of it is cobblers. Mm. And, um, and, you know, well, that, that's what I think. What do you think drives the immense interest in this case? I mean, it's obviously got a lot of the sort of tabloid ingredients of, yeah. you know, sex, evil crimes, money, masses of money and powerful people. That would probably explain the interest, but it seems to me even more intense than anything else. What, can you put your finger on what it is? Well, I think it also, of course, has a royal ingredient just to complete yeah. that uh, yeah. pack of cards, <laughs> if you want. And, uh, you know, we, we're coming through a uh, this, we're still in the midst of this COVID situation, and it's it's just something else to keep people interested by. I mean, I think the money really is at the base of it, because we now know that something like $125 million has been paid to something like 120 girls uh, or accusers by the Jeffrey Epstein estate. On that basis, it is likely that uh, their legal teams will have collected something like $60 million on the basis of uh, no win, no fee type percentages. Mm. So I think there's been a real interest to drive this by the lawyers. It was given an enormous kick by the US government when it ran uh, through its uh, attorney in the Southern District of New York, a quite egregious uh, press conference on the day of my sister was arrested, mm. pointing to pictures of her with uh, Jeffrey Epstein and saying, in terms, she is guilty. Mm. She is uh, guilty of these crimes. She's a monster. She's slithered away to some fancy uh, abode in New Hampshire and so on. It was really shocking. And everybody piles in then behind it. And then you have these uh, enormously... Uh, powerful films that were run by Netflix, amongst others, to keep this whole game going. And, and of course, the accusers and their lawyers take uh, front stage, mm. stay, come at the front of these pictures, and that's still going on, in my view, completely wrongly, where there are perhaps three, four, five, half a dozen uh, non-testifying accusers of my sister on the networks this week, with their allegations and their uncorroborated uh, statements, which are deeply, deeply uh, prejudicial, and it's completely wrong that this can be allowed to be going on in the midst of a trial. It wouldn't happen in England. You clearly find it uh, upsetting. Has it made you depressed about the state of the world? Look, I'm, a, I'm basically an optimist as a person and I've, you know our family's had a lot of knocks one way or another I've, you know we've got up i believe that gillen will be exonerated and i believe that she will get up from this and get on with her life so i'm hopeful for uh, for her and for us as a family i think that the world is uh, just in one of its terrible fits at the moment certainly in, in the west uh, which makes me depressed about uh, what's happening in education, higher education, the whole business of cancelling people for their views instead of just accepting that other people can have different views to you. But, mm. I mean, in, just to come back to Gillen, because that's what we're talking about, she has a lot of friends, but none of those friends have been able to come out and publicly support her for fear of being cancelled mm. as uh, from their jobs. I know for a fact that a particular friend of ours who's been very helpful uh, in press matters, actually, has lost two board positions as a direct result of his friendship with uh, Gillen. A friend of hers in America similarly lost her job. So this is real, what we're talking about. And people's livelihoods are being broken up. I mean, you know, in, in England, of course, the, the a professor who was chased out of her job in a university very recently because she chose to have slightly different views to the prevailing uh, ones upon uh, transgender issues. Mm. We live in these times, and I, I regret intensely uh, that that's the case, and I hope that we'll get through them. 
And what about the American legal system? Have you sort of given up any confidence in it? Huh. Well, let's see what the jury have to say. I mean, thank goodness we do have a, a jury. My, my view is, has that jury been so poisoned by the plethora of um, negative comment for the last two years that it's unable to reach an impartial decision based only on the facts in front of them, uh, on the assumption that uh, they are able to do that and that my sister is acquitted, then uh, you know I will have be able to say that justice has been seen to take place. But actually, uh, a system where you know, my sister has refused bail on f four, five, six occasions, where she's banged up 500 days in isolation, where she has to wear shackles at trial, where she's not properly fed, clearly there's something wrong with that system. And I know that if she is acquitted, one of the things that she wants to use her experience and her fame, uh, if you can call it that, is to put it to the use of trying to improve the conditions of pre-trial detainees because it's just disgraceful what's happening. And finally, um, I quite understand if you don't want to answer this question, but you suggested earlier that your sister believes that Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself and you think there might be something in that. If he was killed by somebody, who do you think it would have been? Uh, or who was behind well, no, it? No, I'm perfectly happy to answer that. I, I do happen to think my sister does think that he was killed. I'm content to myself to, to rely on uh, a suicide, but you know, it doesn't really matter, the man's dead. Your second question as to who would have uh, killed him, that's an open matter. One of the whole set of uh, conspiracy theories and allegations about this whole case is that there are other men who have been involved and were uh, also uh, uh, basically involved in criminal activities with underage girls, although that's never been proved. There's a famous case coming up uh, between Alan Dershowitz, uh, the well-known American lawyer, and Virginia Jufri, uh, who is also the accuser of my sister and of Prince Andrew. So we're going to see that's going to be tested uh, right uh, in the coming months next year. I don't know who would have knocked Jeffrey Epstein off. Well, Ian Maxwell, thank you so much for joining us uh, and for talking to us about this difficult subject. Welcome.